we're at lesson number 11 today. And uh, last week, of course, we completed our study of all the blessings that come to ours through our Lord Christ. And you remember some of those blessings are forgiveness and reconciliation and redemption and justification and, and all the many blessings that come from from our Lord Christ and his death on the cross for us and his resurrection, all of these things. And then we began studying a little bit last week about the Holy Spirit, and we're going to continue with that today, the study of the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit, and uh, what he means in our lives and all of those kind of things. We, at the end of the last session, too, we talked a little bit about the Holy Christian Church. And remember that the Holy Christian Church is also referred to in the New Testament as the body of Christ. And the Holy Christian Church is all believers all over the world, no matter what denomination they be, may be in. And when we confess in the creed that we believe in the Holy Christian Church, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about the Christ Church here on earth uh, uh, includes every believer, no matter what denomination. When you look to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, uh, you are a member of the Holy Christian Church. And so whenever Christian, wherever Christians are in the world, they are members of the Holy Church. Christian Church, and and uh, so there are Lutherans, and like I say, there are Baptists and Methodists and Roman Catholics, and but any person, no matter what his uh, denominational background, if he believes in Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior, um, then uh, he is a member of the Holy Christian Church. Holy, Christ, of course, there are denominations. That's the visible church denominations, and. Uh, and uh, what makes denominations that there are those that take away from the scriptures, and there are those who add to the scriptures, there are those who take away from the gospel, and there are those who add to the gospel. And when you have that happening, uh, then you have denominations. And, uh, and our, our goal, of course, is to be true to the scriptures uh, just as closely as we can be, and we hope and pray that uh, that is so. So uh, today we're going to go on and we're going to uh, study about the Holy Spirit and the continued work of the Holy Spirit. So in your catechism here, in your little uh, booklet, if you would look at that, uh, I think you said it's on page 8 or page 9, the third article. And the work of the Holy Spirit is called, what's that big word? Huh? Sanctification. Sanctification, Yes. The work of the Holy Spirit is called sanctification. And that big word simply means make holy. Make holy. And it is the Holy Spirit who makes us holy through faith. As the Holy Spirit brings to us the gift of faith, it is in that that we are made holy. All of the religions, and we tried to bring that out last week, all the other religions would have us make ourselves holy by doing certain things. And when you do these things, then supposedly you make yourself holy and acceptable to God. The Christian faith says there's no way that you can make yourself holy. There's no way that you can make yourself right with God. That finally, that comes only through justification. God declares us holy, and that comes through faith. And the Holy Spirit, of course, is the giver of faith. So, in the article, if you'll notice that, we say, I believe in the Holy Spirit. Sometimes you'll hear Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit, same thing, of course. Uh, one uh, is uh, from Latin and the other one is from German. Ghost, of course, comes from the German word Geist, which meant uh, spirit. But uh, spirit, of course, comes from the Latin word spiritus. So we have Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, uh, same person, of course. And then the Holy Christian Church, and remember last week we said it is holy because... Uh, those within it have the gift of forgiveness and it is Christian because it is built upon Christ and it is called the church because the word church in the original language simply means called out and all people who are in the church are people who have been called out of the world or called out of death or called out of sin all of those kind of thoughts huh so holy Christian church um, and then the communion of saints and it is the Holy Spirit who creates the communion of saints. Forgiveness of sins, the Holy Spirit brings to us that gift, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. What we want to do today, then, is look more closely at the work of the Holy Spirit. And that work is described in the little paragraph underneath what I just read. And uh, so what does this mean? Well, you look at that and it says, I believe that I cannot by my own Reason or strength, believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord. 
What that is saying is this, that there's no way that I'm going to reason myself into the Christian faith. There's no way that I'm going to will myself into the Christian faith. I cannot make myself a Christian. You did not make yourself a Christian. You did not give to yourself the gift of faith. It didn't come by reason, didn't come by study, came by the Holy Spirit working through the gospel in your heart to give you the gift of faith. So, what those first words do is take all glory out of self and give the glory to the Lord. I believe that I cannot, by my own reason or strength, believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord, or come to him. I don't come to him. He comes to me. That's the point of it all. I don't come to him. He comes to me. So my faith is a gift. My faith is a miracle. My Lord Christ has come to me and has given to me this gift which connects me to him. So how did I become a Christian? Well, the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel. The Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel. And to look at that, look at... Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3. That is on page 959. 959. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3. 959. Listen to this passage. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is cursed, accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. That if I can say Jesus Christ is my Lord, or if I can say Jesus Christ is my Savior, I can say that with conviction only because the Holy Spirit has given me the gift of faith. So I am called by the gospel. Ever think of this? There are no believers where there is not the gospel. There's no believers where there's never been a Christian. You see, Christians go to those who are not believing. So you take this tribe off somewhere in the jungles and so on and so forth. They do not believe in Jesus Christ and they will not until someone takes to them the gospel in which they will hear about Jesus Christ. That's the whole point of missions. Believers don't uh, arise without hearing the gospel. The Holy Spirit does not just flit around, jumping on people and giving them the gift of faith. The Holy Spirit always works through the gospel, you see. That's why it is so important, of course, to, to be inviting, to be taking, bringing people to the gospel, and so on and so forth, you see, that... Uh, that when I heard the gospel preached on Ash Wednesday and those weeks following that, I came to know Jesus Christ. That's why. That's why we invite people to church constantly, you see, and are taking the gospel out, our callers going out, and, and all the different ways in which we are trying to get the gospel. That's why we have a radio program on Sunday morning. That's why we distribute. Uh, that's why we have a school, you see, to get the gospel to little children. Why we have a vacation Bible school to get the gospel to little children. The whole point, you see, is to get the gospel to people, to children, whatever, that they, the Holy Spirit can then work through that gospel and bring to them the gift of faith. Okay? So he calls us by the gospel. No one knows Jesus except through the gospel and the Holy Spirit working through that gospel. Then I want you to look at 2 Thessalonians 2.14. Go back just a few pages. 2 Thessalonians 2.14, Second Thessalonians 2.14, that's on page 989, 989. See, that very truth that we come to faith only through the hearing of the gospel, that it is through the gospel that the Holy Spirit works, that's why Jesus sent the disciples out into the world. See the connection between that and the Great Commission? Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. That he sends the apostles out into the world to take the gospel to the world. And, and that's still so today. That the only way people can come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior is through the Holy Spirit working through the gospel. And so you look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 14. Verse 14. There it says, To this 
He called you through our gospel. He's talking to Thessalonians. How did you Thessalonians become Christians? Why, did there, why, why were there Christians in Thessalonica? Well, because of this. <clears throat> to this he called you through our gospel so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. There were no Christians in Thessalonica before the Apostle Paul got there. And the Apostle Paul came to Thessalonica and began preaching the gospel and talking to people about the Lord Jesus Christ. And the first thing you know, you had a congregation. The Holy Spirit worked, brought people to faith, and a congregation came into existence. And the letters here to the Thessalonians are letters written to that congregation, two of them. But that's so important to note. To this he called you through our gospel. Called them to what? Called them to faith. Look at back at verse 13. But we, ought also to, but we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. See what he's saying now. Here are these people in Thessalonica. They have uh, been called to the Lord. Uh, he has worked in them the work of sanctification, the spirit, and so on. He has brought them to the truth, the truth of the gospel, the truth of the scriptures. To this he called you. What did he call you? He called you to sanctification. He called you to faith. He called you to truth through our gospel so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Timothy 1.9 is another passage that also helps us understand this. If you'll go back just a couple of pages. 2 Timothy 1.9. 2 Timothy 1.9. And that's on page 995. 995. 995. I'll, I'll start reading at verse 8. Verse 8, do you have it? Verse 8. Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus, before the ages began. Boy, that's something. How, why are, think of this. Why are you here? Why are you here today? Why do you believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior? Look what it says here. This is fantastic. This is just way, this is something you see. All of this happened way back when. When did God call you to be his own? Before the ages began, way back in eternity, before there was anything, before there was creation, God knew you before there was a creation. God knew that you would exist. God knew that you would be alive. God planned your, God planned your life even before there was that very first day of creation. And he called you. He has called you now to himself who saved us and called us to a holy calling. A holy calling is a calling separate from the world. Very special. God is working in your heart. Not because of our works. God didn't look at you and say, hey, I know uh, he's a good person and all this kind of... He didn't call you because of your works. He called you because of his grace. Do you see that? But because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. Already way back, before there was anything. In his grace, although we didn't deserve it, he called us and, dis and determined to make us his own. So you see in these passages that, that it is his doing. I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him, but the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, by the good news of Jesus, the story of his life, death, and Resurrection, all of those things. Revelation 22, verse 17, right at the very end of the Bible, right at the very end of the Bible, Revelation chapter 22, verse 17, verse 17. That's on page 1042, 1042. Do you have it? 1042, 1042. 
10.42. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let him, and let the one who hears say, Come. And let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. The Spirit, of course, is inviting. Always the Spirit is inviting us again through the gospel. And the bride. Now in the book of Revelation, the bride is the church. And so how do people come to know Christ Jesus? They come to know Christ Jesus through the gospel as the bride, as the church takes the gospel to people. And as the Spirit then works through that, both are inviting. And let the one who hears say, come. Once you've come to know Jesus Christ as your Savior, then you are inviting others to also come and know him as Savior, you see. In other words, God does not call us just to hold on to this salvation ourselves and keep it all to ourselves. We are to give it away. Give it away. Yeah. I've been looking forward, uh, working on next Sunday sermon, and, and it pictures uh, the, the disciples in the upper room. And uh, uh, the importance there is that God doesn't leave them in the upper room. You know, he come, the Lord Jesus comes <laughs> to the upper room to meet them. But then he says, now it's time to get out of this upper room and get out into the world, get out into the streets and start preaching the gospel and so on. So it's interesting that he comes to them in the upper room to kick them out of the upper room. Yes. Well, what you have here too is this. The Spirit and the Bride say come. The Holy Spirit is the one who works in our hearts and invites us to come. And let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. So the gift of salvation is a gift indeed. A gift. We don't earn it. We don't pay for it. Once we have it, then of course... We give in order to others that others may have it. And so there's the first thing when it comes to the Holy Spirit. And I hope that you can apply that to your own life and just see how, uh, how the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel. Notice that Luther makes it very personal. He says, look at your faith. Where did you get it? Well, you didn't get it by your own reason, by your own intellect, by your own knowledge, by your own strength, by your own will. You got it because... God chose you way back before there was ever a world and saw to it that you received the gospel. Someone has brought you the gospel. Now the question is, who brought you the gospel? Who brought you the gospel? Maybe it was your parents that brought you the gospel in holy baptism. Maybe it was a friend that brought you the gospel. Maybe it was a teacher that brought you the gospel. Maybe it was a neighbor who brought you the gospel. Someone has brought you the gospel. Maybe, like I said, maybe your parents, grandparents, whomever. But someone has come to you with the gospel and the Holy Spirit was worked through that gospel to give to you the gift of faith. Now, what's so important, and we'll note this too as we go on, is that your faith is a gift through the gospel and your faith is maintained only through the gospel. That's why it is so tremendously important to continue hearing the gospel week after week after week after week. Because unless you keep hearing the gospel week after week after week, uh, you're going to lose your faith. That which has been created by the gospel will also die without the gospel. Hear that again. That which has been created by the gospel will die without the gospel. And we drift away. Either we are growing closer to our Lord through the gospel, or we will drift away from the Lord for lack of gospel. See, is that simple? Now... That's important to know because your faith is not, you didn't will your faith, you see. If, you, if people begin to believe that they have willed their own faith, then they don't change their mind and so on and so forth. And they think they are saved simply because they've made a decision. That's not it, you see. I have received a gift. I've not made a decision. I have received a gift. And I can lose that gift unless I keep feeding that faith which the gift has indeed given me. So that's the very first thing the Holy Spirit does, is he brings to me the gift of faith. Now, through my life now, through God's word and through the gospel, my faith will continue to grow. When he gives me that faith, it's a baby faith, isn't it? It's a baby faith, yes. And uh, 
I must continue to grow then in that faith as time goes on. So the gift is given, but then the Holy Spirit continues to work into my, in my heart to enlighten me is the next thing. But look what it says. He enlightens me. Do you see that? That the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel. Enlighten me with his gifts. Now I want you to look back at 2 Corinthians again. We looked there once, but let's go back there again. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. Because the Holy Spirit enlightens. He gives me the gift of faith. And then he begins to develop that faith. He begins to enlighten my heart, which means he begins to show me more and more. But look at that, 965, 965. Do you have it? Four, six. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That the Holy Spirit now works through God's word, works through, works through the gospel to enlighten me. And that means he's showing me more and more. He has brought me out of darkness. He is bringing me out of darkness and he is showing me more and more. He enlightens me through God's word and through the gospel. And that will go on now for the rest of your life once you come to know Jesus Christ. That's the importance of studying God's Word. And as I brought out in the sermon this morning, you see we are constantly learning and committed to the growing in God's Word. Because it is through that Word that He enlightens me. That He enlightens me. You know, and, and we begin to see things quite differently than the world sees them. See, quite differently. I brought that out in the first lesson when I talked, I think I talked about the, the eagle's egg. You remember that? That uh, in our society today, uh, you can abort a baby, you can kill a baby, and uh, society says that's okay. But also in our society today, uh, we say that if you find a, the egg of a bald eagle, uh, you can't destroy that because inside that egg, there is a bald eagle. And if you destroy the egg of a bald eagle, you can spend a year in jail and have a fine of $5,000. Now, that doesn't make sense that you can kill a baby in a womb, a human baby, but you cannot build, kill an eagle in an egg. And that's not because of ignorance. Some very intelligent, bright people believe that contradiction. The difference is light and darkness. You see, once the Holy Spirit has begun to enlighten you, you begin to see that in a womb of a woman, that's a baby. That's a child, you see. And that life is precious, and you cannot snuff it out, see. So it's a different way of thinking. So sometimes, you know, we think about how different the world thinks over against how different Christians think, see. The world says, you know, why in the world would anyone spend two or three hours on a Sunday morning in church listening and studying and so on? So doesn't make any sense. Why would you waste three or four hours on a Sunday morning looking into a Bible and hearing it preached? That doesn't make any sense to the world. To a person in whom the Holy Spirit has been working, though, it makes all the sense in the world, you see, because that's bringing God into our lives, that's relating to him, that's... Uh, getting our priorities, had all kinds of things, you see. That makes sense. Tithing doesn't make any sense to the man of the world, does it? My goodness, that you would give 10% of your income away for the Lord's work and for other purposes? That doesn't make any sense. Why wouldn't you use that for yourself? Tithing doesn't make any sense from the world's point of view. But from the Christian's point of view, in which the Holy Spirit has been enlightening, makes all the sense in the world, you see, doesn't it? You see? So that's what it means here by enlightening. The Holy Spirit is constantly enlightening me. He's showing me more and more in this book, you know, more and more as I go through this. And, and you can never get to the bottom of it. Like I said this morning in, in church, you know, there is a depth here which we can never reach. We can never reach the bottom of this depth here. There is so much here. And so, golly, I come back to this book over and over again. And after all these years, still continue to see so much more. And, and, and even after 
reading this book for 70 years, you know, practically every day for 70 years, uh, the Holy Spirit's constantly enlightened me. I'm seeing more than, you know, I have kids in, in the confirmation class and so on. You say something, do you know the Christmas story? Oh, yeah, we know the Christmas story. Well, you knew the Christmas story last Christmas, but you don't know it this Christmas yet. You know, did you know the Psalm 23? Well, yeah, I've memorized Psalm. Well, you knew Psalm 23 yesterday, but you don't know Psalm 23 today. Because the Holy Spirit's always enlightening. He's always showing us something that we have never seen before. For years we have read here uh, in confirmation class, in my school confirmation class, we have read the Psalms. We read a Psalm every morning. And I've done that for years. And yet every time I come back to that reading of a Psalm again, I'll say, my golly, I've never seen this before. How did I miss this? How have I missed this for 20 years? Never seen it before. Well, that's because suddenly the Holy Spirit shows me something in that word that I've not seen before. And he connects it to something else in the word elsewhere in the Bible. So that enlightening goes on. That enlightening goes on. And where we are in life, the Holy Spirit speaks to us at that point and, and perhaps speaks to us in a different way because of what has happened in our life. Last Sunday, for instance, I talked about the resurrection. And many of you were here, you see. And uh, uh, one lady came out who was not uh, a member of ours, uh, visiting here, and uh, her husband died two weeks ago. Her husband died uh, about two weeks ago. And she said, um, boy, that word spoke to my heart this morning. Thank you for your word. Well, I had a lot of teenagers come out, and, and the teenagers are not saying that to me, you know, because they have not had that experience. But here's a lady whose husband, and she probably an elderly lady, said her husband had died just two weeks ago. She said, that, that word spoke to my heart. That's enlightening going on. That's what that is. That's enlightening. The Holy Spirit used that to touch her heart because of her need at that particular point. So that goes on as we go through life. Different experiences, and he speaks to us. And all of that is called enlightening. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. That is on page 1015. 1015, chapter 2 Peter, or 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Boy, this is a beautiful verse. Look at this. Page 1015. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So you see where Luther's language comes from here? He has called you, who? The Holy Spirit, out of darkness, into his marvelous light so that you see more and more through the working of the Holy Spirit through the scriptures. And the more you see in these scriptures, of course, I mean, the more the Holy Spirit, as you come back to these scriptures over and over again, you'll see more and more there. They are so rich. There is so much. You know, I remember this, for instance, you know, we have all the things on child psychology this year and how to raise, I mean, this, in these times and how to raise children, all those kind of things. And I remember this story about Mrs. Eisenhower, the mother of Dwight Eisenhower, who's the president. She had four boys. She had four sons, all raised in a little house out here in Abilene, Kansas. And uh, after these boys are all grown, and of course, one's a president and one's a, of the United States, another one's a president of a college, and, and they're all very successful and very noted men and accomplished much and done much and so on and so forth. And uh, someone asked her, you know, what, what, was your, uh, what guided you in raising your children? Where, where did you uh, get the guidance that you needed for raising your children? What books did you read and so on? Well, she said, I, I read the book of Proverbs. That's all I needed. I just read the book of Proverbs. That tells you all you need when it comes to raising children. How true that is, huh? Yeah, so true. So she did a pretty good job with just the book of Proverbs. Well, what that's saying is that the Holy Spirit enlightens, you see. He calls us out of darkness, and he's constantly showing us more and more. 
And um, it's, just, it's just amazing. Um, but that's why we keep coming back to the scriptures. And every time we do, the Holy Spirit's at work. Sanctified. He sanctifies us too. Look at that too. He has called me by the gospel. He has lightened me with his gifts. And he has sanctified me. So what does that mean? Look at 2 Corinthians 5, 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 17. And that is on page... Chapter 517, that's on page 966, 966, 517, 517, 2 Corinthians 517, do you have it, 966, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Once you come to know Jesus Christ as your Savior, the Holy Spirit's going to go at work in your life to make you into a new person. You're not just going to believe certain uh, doctrines or certain principles or anything like that. He's going to change you. He's going to change you into a new person. He's going to make you a different person as he speaks to you and shapes you. You're new, a new creature. That's what Christians are. They are new creatures, made that by the Holy Spirit himself. And then look at Second Ephesians chapter 2. Go back just a couple of pages. Ephesians chapter 2, this is on page 976. 976. I'm just trying to think of the man. Ah, just died here last year, so football announcer for the NFL for years. Ah, can't think of his name. Ah. If I stay it, you'll hear it. Anyway. It's not Fred Gifford. Huh? It's not Fred Gifford or something. No, no, no. He's not an announcer. Football announcer, no. I can't think of his name. Anyway, uh, you know, very successful in the media and uh, announcer and all sports, you know, uh, golfing and, and baseball and football and everything. Oh, such a big name for years and years. And uh, uh, so well known, that name. And, um, but became alcoholic. Would have nothing to do with the Lord. It didn't need the Lord, had nothing to do with the Lord, but became alcoholic. And finally, uh, his family just uh, really worked to get him into treatment and so on. And once he got into treatment then, and in treatment he came to know Jesus Christ, began reading the Bible. There was the point, in treatment. And he was at the Betty Ford Treatment Center out in California, I remember that. And uh, in treatment, then he began reading the Bible himself and, and just began to change him. And, and he came out of there as a new man. And he said, oh, my goodness, if, I, I'm so thankful that I've come to know Jesus Christ now. But, oh, how I wish I had come to know him years ago, years ago. But, uh, again, a, a new man and saw himself as a new man because of coming to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Well, there's all kinds of examples of that in the Bible. The Apostle Paul, of course, is, is uh, one of the prime examples. And right now there's a movie. Anyone have seen the movie yet? No. But there's a movie right now called Paul Apostle, which has been getting some good uh, reviews and some good writings about it. But anyway, there's an example, too, of a man just completely changed by Jesus Christ coming into his life. And then if you read in the New Testament, that's what you see in the Gospel writers, huh? And you see John, you see Peter, and you see these men. And as you see them in the beginning of the Gospels, and then you see them later as they have lived with the Lord and walked with the Lord, and you read about them in their epistles, uh, you see how they've been changed by the Lord working in their lives. Huh? You know, John, the Gospel, the, the epistles of John, you read the epistles of John, and then you have to realize this man who writes these beautiful epistles and talks so much about love and so much about kindness and all those kind of things. He's the same guy whom Jesus called Boanerges. And Boanerges simply means this, that he was a hothead who couldn't keep his mouth shut. You know, 
And you read that, and this is Jesus says, I'm going to call you guys bow and energies, you know, because you just blow up so quickly. You've got that kind of temper. And then it was Jesus who changed these men. That's the Holy Spirit. That's sanctifying, you see. That's sanctifying. This is what this is talking about. Look at uh, chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Look at that, would you please? Now, we've looked at verses 8 and 9, and they are tremendous verses. Just go back to those 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. That's what we've been talking about, how the Holy Spirit gives us this gift. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. Not a result of works, so that no one, can, no one may boast. Huh? You didn't do it yourself, so you can't boast. But now, once you have received this gift, Look what happens. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Huh? Think of that. Faith is a gift. It's not the result of good works. But good works are the result of faith. Listen to that very carefully, what I just said, because that's so important. Faith is not the result of good works. But good works are the result of faith. Huh? So f good works do not make faith, but faith makes good works. And look what it says. Paul says this, for we are his workmanship. Once we come to faith and God begins to work in us, he begins to change us. He begins to change our thinking. He begins to change our attitudes. He begins to change how we look at the world. He's, he begins to change how we look at other people, how we relate to other people, all these kind of things. The Holy Spirit is a change agent. Boy, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which, and this is something, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Think of that now in relation to yourself. God is preparing you for something good in the future. Huh? But he's always getting us ready, isn't he? He's always getting us ready to serve him in a certain way that perhaps we don't even think of right now. You know, he's getting us ready to serve him in some way that we perhaps don't even think of right now. He's got something planned for us. And um, that's the exciting thing about life. Even, uh, you know, the old, it doesn't make any difference how old you get. And you keep asking the question, what's God getting me ready for? What is God getting me ready for? I don't know. But I do know this. He's getting me ready for something. And that's why he says, stay in my word and stay close to me. And, and uh, every opportunity of service that comes along, take a hold of that. And, because God is constantly getting me ready to use me in a different way than I've been used perhaps in the past. But I'm his workmanship. I'm his workmanship. And that's what sanctifies means. You know, the closer you get to the Lord Jesus, the more like him you become. Huh? As baby Christians, we come as baby Christians. And babies, you know, watch their parents and are shaped by their parents. And, and, uh, all the, uh, and um, that's what happens here, too. As we get closer to our Lord Christ, more and more he shapes us. More and more he shapes us. Look at chapter, John chapter 14, verse 25. John chapter 14, verse 25. And that is on page 901. 901. John 14, 25, and 26. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. 
that not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Yes. This is Jesus now. This is the upper room. Jesus is speaking to the disciples in the upper room. And by the way, you might note this, that uh, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the record of the upper room is, is quite short. And the only thing that they tell you really is that they had the Passover meal there, and uh, Jesus washed the disciples' feet, and uh, he instituted the Lord's Supper. And that's about it. But if you go to the Gospel of John, and you start already in chapter 14, you have this long conversation, because they did a lot of talking that night in the upper room. John, writing his gospel many years later, says, this is what they talked about. And he talks about the Holy Spirit. He talks about heaven. And you read those chapters from, from uh, chapter 14, 15, 16, 17, about the upper room and the conversation that went on that night in that upper room. My, that was an exciting evening. Ended up so tragically, of course, in the Garden of Gethsemane. But he's talking to them and uh, just... Uh, uh, so much about the Holy Spirit and about heaven, all those things. That's where he says, uh, in that first part of that chapter there, he says about, uh, don't let your hearts be troubled. I'm going home to my Father. I'm going to make a room for you in heaven, all of those things. But in all of those chapters, and here too, he's saying the same thing. These things I have spoken to you while I'm still here with you, but the helper. And in the old English, that word helper is, is translated counselor, but the helper, the counselor, the comforter, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I've said to you. Here again, there is so much in scripture. And the word that's used there is comforter or encourager or, comforter or uh, counselor or helper. Think of this. Today, we have all kinds of counselors in our society. My goodness, we've got counselors and counselors and counselors. What in the world did they do 100 years ago or a couple hundred years ago? How did society ever function without all the counselors? Huh? The Holy Spirit was the counselor, and the scriptures were the counselor. I think of this too, so often we hear, you know, when there's a tragedy in a, in a high school or something and there's the shootings and they're going to call in counselors. And I wonder what, do, since they cannot talk in the public school about the Lord Jesus and they cannot talk about faith and they cannot talk about resurrection and things, what do those counselors talk about? I can't imagine. I've, I've often wondered that and ne never run into anyone that I could ask. What do you talk about? In a terrible tragedy like that, if you can't talk about the Lord, and you can't talk about Christ Jesus, and you can't talk about salvation, why do you comfort people in a time of tragedy without talking about the Lord? But somehow uh, they do. And so we go to counselors uh, for all kinds of things, and yet those counselors do not talk about the Lord. And that's the answer to so many, many, many things is, um, is the Lord Jesus and the scriptures. To get back into the scriptures. Yes. Well, in all these things that I've been saying to you, have any thoughts or any questions about them? Any thoughts or questions about them? Sanctification and the growing in faith. Justification is one thing and sanctification is another. Justification, you can read those two big words in the scriptures. Justification is when I come to faith. When I come to faith. And when I come to faith and believe in Jesus Christ as my Savior, at that point I have the gift of salvation. I have the gift of heaven. What I don't have is how to live the faith. I am a Christian, but I don't know how to live as a Christian. And what sanctification is, is this. It is learning how to live. So this is sanctification. Justification comes back here. Justification. At this point, I believe in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, and I have the gift of heaven. I'm like the thief on the cross. I'm like a thief on the cross. In that moment, he receives the gift of salvation. Or, like other people in the scriptures, you read about, you know, the Ethiopian eunuch and so on. But all of these different people who come to know Jesus, at that very moment of coming to know Jesus, they have the gift of heaven and the gift of salvation. Now, after that comes sanctification. And the Holy Spirit is now working in my heart to show me how to put into my life 
my faith. I have the gift of faith back here. But how do I live that faith? In this situation, how do I live that faith? And how do I live that faith in this situation? And so you have this continuum. All the rest of your life, you should be growing in faith. And how do you live the faith? Huh? So right now, some of you are back here. You're just starting out. And some of you are right here. Huh? And we hope that in 50 years, you'll be way up here. You know, but you still got you know, some time to go after that. And now, so... This person back here who's just starting out is going to mess up, probably mess up over against this person out here. Yeah. So you read in the police blotter in Natchez in Kansas that there's some members of Trinity up there. And I visit them in the, in the jail. Are they Christian? Yeah, they're Christian. They just haven't got it all together yet. You know, they're, they're not applying to Jesus Christ, applying Jesus to their lives like they should be. They're not living for him as they should be. And hopefully that will wake them up to begin living for him as they should be, you see. So all of my life. Now, it's important for us as parents, you know, it's important for parents to realize this too. That my, you know, my faith may be up here. I may have grown to this point, but my teenagers are back here. And I cannot expect of them in terms of faith where I am. So I have to take that into consideration always, huh? And, uh, and their understanding of the faith and putting the faith into practice and all those kind of things. And yet, as we grow, as we grow, they're still growing too. Huh? And so I've got two daughters, 156 and 152 years old. And they still call me on the phone to ask me about this and that and the other thing, and about the Lord's, what, what's the Lord say this, or about the scriptures say this and that kind of things. And they're still growing. They're still growing, and I can see that, of course, in their lives. And um, yes, one of the things about being in a congregation as long as I have here, and the beautiful part is, you know, is I've seen lots of young people uh, back here at confirmation class or have just come to faith and come to know the Lord, and I've seen them grow through the years. And I saw them back here, and I see them now, and I say, my goodness, what a miracle that is. And how they've changed, and how they've changed, you see. And, and uh, there's people up here this morning in jail. I mean, this morning there's people up here in, the, in worshiping here. And I, I knew them. I met them. There's two people up there this morning that I met 25 years ago in jail. And you would never know they are the same people, you see. But they are. And the Lord has changed. And they've worked. They're beautiful people. But what's happened is the Lord has been at work in their lives, see. And you see that. You say, golly. And that convinces you then of the work of the Holy Spirit and how real it is and, and uh, how tremendously important it is and all those kind of things. The Holy Spirit changes us into people more and more like our Lord Jesus Christ. So I have to, remem have to remember that always, that we're always growing. But again, that's why it is so important. And that's why we talk about worshiping every Sunday, uh, hearing God's word every Sunday. You see, the one person who wants to keep this from happening is whom? The devil. Yeah, the devil wants to keep this from happening. And he will, and since all of this happens through God's word, he's going to keep you away from what? The word. He's going to keep you away from the word. See, the devil's intent is to keep you away from God's word. If he can keep you away from God's word, hearing it in worship services, hearing it in Bible class, if he can keep you away from God's word, he can keep you a baby Christian, he can destroy your faith, he can drain the faith out of your life and all those kind of things. That's why it is so important to hear and continually be hearing that word all through life. You know, and, and, and we never, like I've said, it, it never ends because he's... He's always after us, and he will do anything and everything to destroy our faith, and he never, he's going to be attacking for the rest of your life. And, your only, and our only uh, weapon in our fight with him is God's word. And we read that when we uh, talked about him, that Jesus had the, even the weapon that Jesus used over against the devil was God's word. And when the devil was trying to uh, tempt him, Jesus came back to him with God's word, all of it taken from the Old Testament, all of it taken from Deuteronomy, of course. But Jesus himself used that word to ward off Satan and continue in the way in which God had planned for him to go. Yeah. Well, any thoughts or any questions connected with that? I hope I can get that across to you because it is so very, very important. Yes. 
the work of the Holy Spirit. Can you pray to the Holy Spirit? Sure, because the Holy Spirit is what? He is true God. And so what do you pray for when you pray to the Holy Spirit? You pray that he would strengthen your faith. You pray that he would enlighten you. You pray that he would draw you closer to the Lord Jesus, that, would help to, that he would help you to see things in the scripture that perhaps you've never seen before, that he would just open your eyes to the wonder of it, of everything that, uh, that we would uh, talk about. But it is he who creates faith. It is he who creates faith. And uh, so you have to ask yourself that question, why do I believe? How did I get my faith? Well, the answer is the Holy Spirit has called you by the gospel, enlightened you with his gift, sanctified and kept you in the true faith. In the same way, go on, in the same way that he calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth and keeps it with Jesus Christ in the one true faith. You see, this is the wondrous thing. This Holy Spirit is working all over the world in the hearts of people to bring them to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And the DVD that we saw in, in, in Bible class this morning, another interesting statement was this. What does the average Lutheran in the world today look like? The average Lutheran in the world today look like? Well, human. <laughs> yeah, of course he's human. What color is he? What color is the average Lutheran in America today, or in the world today? In the world? In the world. Are they going to say non-white? Well, I'm, I'm asking you the question. <laughs> what does the average Lutheran in the world today look like? The answer that was given this morning, the DVD, and I believe it, he looks like an East African. Yeah, that's what I was yes. Saying. There's more Lutherans in Ethiopia than there are in America. Do you know that? There's more Lutherans in Ethiopia. That's East Africa. Huh? There's more Lutherans in Indonesia than there are Missouri Synod Lutherans in America, you see. And where is that? The Christian church is, you know, growing in what parts of the world? In America, we're having trouble. And we've been, the Lord has blessed us materially, and we've got all kinds of problems here. But my goodness, the church is just growing tremendously in Korea, in China, in Africa, you see. My goodness, great, wonderful things uh, there's, are happening in those places. And, um, yeah, so, and, uh, so the Holy Spirit's working all around the world. You know, he's not just, he's working right here. And that's why you are here, but he's also working, my golly, all over the world. Okay, we are ready to go on with the work of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to look at, we've looked at, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church. Now we're going to look at the communion of saints. I think the first question we have to ask is, what is a saint? And uh, our belief there is a little different than is, is in the Catholic Church. And so I would have you look at Romans chapter 1, verse 7. Romans chapter 1, verse 7. And that's on page 939. 939. Paul is writing to the Christians in Rome. And so in verse 7, he addresses them in this way. To all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints. And if you read in his other letters, he refers to the saints in those places too. To the saints in Corinth and the saints in Philippi and so on. So what is a saint? In the Roman Catholic Church, a saint is a person who is dead and supposedly has performed some miracles and the church goes through a whole process of declaring that person a saint. In the New Testament, a saint is simply a believer in Christ. And it comes from that word sanctified. We have that word sanctified up there. A saint is a person 
who is being sanctified. He's a believer in Christ, and, and the Holy Spirit is working in him and uh, changing him into the person that God has called him to be. And so we are all called to be saints, and uh, you can call yourself a saint. Do you know that, Reagan? You can look at the mirror in the morning, and you can say, Good morning, Saint Reagan. Did you ever do that? Haven't done that yet. Okay, well, you can do that. Because we're all saints. Yes, because we are believers in Jesus Christ. Now, if you tell somebody you're a saint, they're probably going to think you are bragging because they're going to think, you're, well, you must think he's really pretty good. No, I'm simply saying I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. Now, the Holy Spirit then brings us into a community of saints. And so a saint is a believer, and a community of saints is just saints that are gathered together. And out here... I'm the, out here, here I am in the world, and um, the Holy Spirit comes to me uh, through the gospel. Someone brings me the gospel, and I, I come to believe in Jesus Christ as my Savior. But the, world, but the Holy Spirit does not leave me out there in the world by myself. What the Holy Spirit does is he puts me into a community of saints. And a community of saints is simply a congregation, a church, you know, of believers, and um, like a Trinity Lutheran Church. And the reason he brings me into this community, saints, is because if he leaves me out here by myself, boy, the devil is going to be attacking me, and the world is going to be attacking me, and my own sinful flesh is going to be attacking me. And they're going to try to bring me back into unbelief. They're going to bring me back or keep me, you know, bring me back into the darkness and so on. And so God moves me from out there by myself into a community of saints. I said that in the sermon this morning. There is no such thing as a lone ranger Christian. There's no such thing as a spiritual hermit or type of thing that the Holy Spirit brings me into a community of saints. Now, why he brings me there is, first of all, he brings me there for my safety, for my safety, to help me or to protect me from all of these enemies because in, this, in the community of saints, there's going to be other Christians around me who are going to um, work hard to keep me in the faith and edify me and strengthen me in faith, encourage me in the faith and all those kind of things. So he brings me here for my spiritual safety. That's one of the big reasons that he brings me into the community of saints for my spiritual safety. Now, when you read the New Testament, it talks about how we are to edify one another and build each other up in the faith and strengthen one another and all of these kind of things. But in the New Testament, this community of saints is also called the body of Christ. And I want you to look at Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. And that's on page 947. 947. Now remember that Romans, of course, is written to a congregation in Rome. That all these letters in the New Testament are letters to congregations that have been formed by the Apostle Paul, the Holy Spirit, working through the gospel that he brings. And so he writes back. That's a whole new thing. You see, a Christian congregation is a whole new thing. How do you live in a congregation? How do people in a congregation live together and relate to each other? So you have a whole new thing going on here. Now, in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, of course, and in New Testament times, there were the synagogues. But a Christian congregation, this is a whole new thing. And he has to write back to these congregations. And he usually has a section where he talks about doctrine. And then he has a very practical session, which he says, now, this is how, do you live, how you live together as God's people in a congregation. So that's what verse 12, or chapter 12 is about here. So follow along. Page 947, and Paul is writing to the church in Rome, these Christians there, and talking to them about what it means to be in a congregation. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. In the Old Testament, of course, there had been animal sacrifices. Those now have ceased. And in the Christian church, there are we sacrifice ourselves for the sake of our brother and the Lord's work and living for the Lord and all those kind of things. But look what he says, the very first thing. Verse 2, do not be conformed to this world. Boy, the world's going to be out there. It's going to be thinking these ways and doing these kind of things. He says, don't be conformed to the world. Don't let the world shape you. Rather, let the Holy Spirit shape you. But... 
Be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. You're not going to listen to the world's ways and the world's will. They're going to be telling you all kinds of things, which is not true. But uh, he says, listen to the Lord and let him shape your thinking. Let him guide you. Now look at verse 3. Next page. <clears throat> for by grace, for by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. One thing that can really tear apart a congregation would be if some folks begin to think that they are better than other folks or they place themselves over against other folks and that type of thing. So he uh, says one of the things you've got to watch out for is, is pride and how that can get in and separate. Verse 4, for as in one body we have many members and the members do not have all have the same function, so we though many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. So we're in a congregation together and uh, it's a body and each of us in the congregation have different gifts and working together and using the gifts that God has given us. That's what makes a congregation work and that's how people relate to each other in the congregation. Having, look at verse 6, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, and the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. So in a congregation, God puts all kinds of different people with different kinds of uh, gifts, and then he calls us to use our gifts in that congregation, and that's what helps, like I said, the congregation to function and carry out the mission that God has given the congregation where it is. So God creates congregations through the working of the Holy Spirit. Then he puts people in those congregations with have all have different gifts, and we use those different gifts in the service of our Lord and carrying out the work of the congregation in the community where he puts us. Now, he goes on then, and he's talking about a congregation and about the body of Christ again. So we're in the body of Christ, we have different gifts, we are there as brothers and sisters, we are united by the Holy Spirit and by our faith in Christ Jesus. Now, verse 9, let love be genuine, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with brotherly affection, Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. All of those things are to help us live one another, uh, live with one another in a congregation. So look what he says to how we are to do in a congregation. We are to love one another with brotherly affection, outdo each other in honor, show each other honor. Uh, in, a, in the work, don't uh, be slothful in working within the congregation. Serve the Lord, rejoice, be patient. Constant in prayer. My goodness, we're always praying for our congregation at home or at the church, wherever. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Uh, we're to look after the financial needs and so on. Seek hospitality. 14, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. When I read that, I think you know, rejoice with those who rejoice. We have weddings in the congregation. Those are times of rejoicing. We have funerals in the congregation. Those are times of weeping. We are to rejoice with those who are rejoicing. We are to weep with those who weep. That's part of the congregational life. Live in harmony with one another. Boy, the devil is always at work in a congregation trying to start, stir up trouble. Do not be haughty. Don't be proud and think you're better than others. But associate with the lowly. There's all kinds of people in a congregation from high to low in terms of society. Never be wise in your own sight. Don't, 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 uh, don't think you know everything. Be always open to the ideas of others and the thoughts of others. Repay no one evil for evil. Don't try to get even with anybody, even though they may do something bad that you don't like. But give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of the Lord. You're always remembering. 
that you're living in the sight of the Lord. You're living in the presence of the Lord himself. You're living in the presence of Jesus. And whenever you meet your brother, whenever you meet a fellow Christian, Jesus is always standing beside you. And your behavior toward that fellow Christian is always to be shaped by the Lord Jesus who is standing beside you. 18, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. You know, you're not going to stir up trouble, and, but live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, <clears throat> I will repay, says the Lord. Don't be trying to get even or get back at the people, that's, that's the Lord's business, not yours. Verse 20, to the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. <clears throat> burning coals on your head, that was a way of saying embarrass him in the, in the ancient world. That was an idiom that uh, said uh, when you do that, you make a person's face red, and that's their way of saying you embarrass people. But verse 21, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And so we're alive in a congregation. We're living in a congregation together with other people. And um, this is how we are to treat one another and live with one another and all of those kinds of things. Another passage that talks to this very same issue is Galatians chapter 6. Remember now that Paul is teaching the folks, how do you live together in a congregation? If you go through Corinthians, you'll find the same kind of thing, Philippians, Ephesians. But now we're going to go to Galatians, and that's chapter 6. And that is on page, oh, let me see here. Galatians chapter 6 is on page 975. Yeah, 975. Yeah, Galatians chapter 6. <clears throat> here it also is telling us, of talking to us about uh, living together as God's people in a congregation. Galatians 6. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. So what, that's, what is that saying? That even in the congregation, even among God's people, even where the Holy Spirit is work, even where the resurrected Christ is present, um, people are going to mess up. And they're going to do that which they should not be doing. And uh, the devil is going to pull folks down. So look what it says. If anyone is caught in any transgression, which means there are going to be folks sinning against each other and doing things which are contrary to the will of God. But when a person falls flat on their face and when they mess up, how are you to respond to that? You who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Now don't go jumping all over him, but uh, certainly go to him as your brother and, and to call him back to the Lord and repentance. But here's the big thing. Keep watch on yourself lest you too be tempted. Hmm? Yeah. There's a saying that I forget who said it. C.S. Lewis. If you can think of yourself as never being tempted in a certain way, that's a sign you've never seen the depth of your own sin. If there's any kind of, if there's any sin, if there's any evil, which you can't imagine yourself doing, you've not seen the depth of your own sin yet. If anyone's sin is greater than you would ever consider or ever think yourself capable of, you haven't seen the depth of your own sin. That's what this is talking about. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. And then verse 2, bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Remember that in the congregation there's all kinds of people bearing all kinds of burdens. And uh, lots of hurting people. And as I look out over the congregation, I can see that, and I see it and know it. Every Sunday morning or all the time, you know see all kinds of, and I know the hurts that are going on in the lives of people. All the people don't know that, but uh, the pastor does, and, and he sees all kinds of burdens. Bear one another, and so we need to support one another and encourage one another. Verse 3, for if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But each one 
test his, let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his brother. Um, when it comes to serving the Lord and doing the things for the Lord, I'm not looking at other people to see what they're doing or not doing. I'm simply looking at myself, not comparing, saying, well, I'm doing more than that person is doing. I'm simply to look to myself and my own relationship to the Lord. Verse 5, for each will have to bear his own load. Then verse 6, let the one who is taught share all good things with the one who teaches, that we are to support those who are teaching us and so on. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap, if we do not give up. So then as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. And so we live together as God's people, supporting one another, encouraging one another, all of those kind of things. But God brings us together, brings us together in order to look out after each other. So once I come into the kingdom, once I come into the body of Christ, I have a whole new outlook. One of the reasons I come to worship on Sunday morning is not simply for me, but it is also for my brother, because my presence supports my brother in his need. One of the reasons I worship and sing, even my singing is to be a blessing to my brother. Everything here, you see, we, we don't think one of the, uh, we give, you see, we give for our brother. We give for each other. We support our church for each other. We are a community. We are a community. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. We are a family. Remember, you know, not, not this bus that we have now, but I remember several years ago, we had a bus and we bought a bus too. And it kind of wore out. And we, but anyway, when we were raising money for that bus, one member said to me, he wasn't going to give to the bus because he didn't have any children in school here. And I said, my goodness, all those children are school, in school are your children because you're a family, you know. And uh, I didn't have any children in school at that time either. But I must look at those children as my children because they are my children, because they are in our family here. And I must provide them with an education. I must do those kind of things. And so we're not here by ourselves. We are here to support and encourage one another and all of those kind of things. And so as you read the New Testament, there's, um, you read these kind of things, that we are to build each other up, up in the faith, that we are to strengthen one another, we are to edify one another, we are to serve one another, we are to love one another, we are to worship together. And so it's a community. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. And when one person hurts, then I hurt. If one person begins to stray away, and Jesus said that too, didn't he? If one sheep begins to stray away, then we are to come after that person and bring that person back into the community. So we are to look after each other. So we encourage one another when it comes to communion. We encourage one another when it comes to worship. We are constantly looking after each other, and we are concerned about each other's spiritual life. And we are, at Trinity here, we're very conscious of that. There's not many churches that have you sign in when you come to worship, but we do have you sign in when you come to worship because that's a way of keeping track. And uh, when you're not in worship and then we make contact with you in one way or another, try to bring you back into the community as brothers and sisters. We keep track of every contact we make with a member. We have a ledger upstairs. If I call you on the phone, that'll go into the ledger. If I send you a card, that will go into the ledger. If the elders come to see you, that will go into the ledger. We wait, making, <clears throat> we keep track of all the contact we have with our people because that's part of our shepherding. That's part of our looking after people. And we want to make sure that that's going on because we are concerned about the spiritual life of our people. And that's what a community of saints is about. And that's why God brings us into a congregation in the first place. One of the things that we're talking about starting now, and we're going to start it, we're going to have what is called ambassadors, and we have um, now a list of all of our people, and um, by area, not by area, yes, by area, by area, and uh, we've put that all together, and uh, 10 people, we're going to have 10 people, or 10 families, 
and uh, all the different areas in, 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 in Atchison here, you know, down this street and so on and out of town and that, that, all these different areas. We figure we'll have 60 different areas and um, we're going to try, have, try to have 60 ambassadors so that these ambassadors will contact our people. There are 10 people in their area, maybe take to them the portals of prayer, bring a letter to them, or just keep in contact with them so that we'll even better be able to keep contact with all of our people and even better able to do this because we have so many that even the elders can't visit all the people and so on and so forth. So we're going to do this and we're working on that right now. We have a chart upstairs or a map upstairs where we've put pins in it. And my goodness, we have lots and lots of people all over Atchison and out in the county and, and uh, all around the area. So we have about 600 families, and that's why we're going to need 60 people who will be ambassadors to reach these people and help keep track of them, keep in contact with them. And it's all part of this, part of keeping us safe spiritually. Because that's why God brings us into the congregation, to look after each other spiritually. Because we've got these enemies who are constantly after us, trying to pull us away from our Lord, trying to mislead our children, the world out there, and all those kind of things. We really have to be concerned about each other. So I'm a member of the community of saints. And that's why we worship together. That's why we want to know each other um, type of thing. See? Now... We also have to ask the question, you know, whom to whom or whom does the community of saints belong to? Who is it that brings people into the community of saints? Well, finally, the community of saints is God's family. And um, so whomever God brings into this family is now my brother and sister within the family. And that does away with race that does away with economic standards, all those kind of things. There's some congregations, you know, uh, which do not welcome other races. And uh, we do, of course, and we do have uh, black people here and have uh, continued to try to reach out in that area. We also have people here. Again, there are some congregations which are pretty much the same economically. And here at Trinity, I know we have people all the way from millionaires and even multimillionaires down to people who are on welfare. And so there's a wide gap there too. But again, that's what the congregation is to be about. There's folks who are very, very educated with doctor's degrees and that type of thing. There are people who are here with eighth grade educations. Doesn't make any difference. God brings all of us together as brothers and sisters. And what makes us, uh, what brings us together is we know Jesus Christ as our savior. We know we are sinners. We knew that we need a savior. We know we are part of God's community, and we know also that he has brought us together for our safety. Now, once he brings us together for safety, though, we are to look after each other. That's most certainly true. But he also brings us together as a congregation so that we can reach out into the world and serve the world around us. And that's the unique thing about a Christian congregation. Salvation is taken care of. I don't have to worry about salvation. The Lord Jesus took care of that. In other religions, you are concerned about your salvation. Everything you're doing is to take care of your own salvation. My salvation is taken care of. I'm going to heaven. I know that. And all of us here. What that does is that frees us to serve the world around us and make the world around us a better place. And so he calls me into the community to go out into the community. That's what he does. He calls me into the community to go out into the community. And so we're concerned about missions, and we're concerned about uh, reaching out to the brother in all kinds of ways. And that's been, the, of course, the history of the church all the way through the years. Think of this, how congregations have done great work. Who started all the hospitals? Where would all the hospitals come from? You know, we have government hospitals now, but who was the original people who started the hospitals? They're church people, aren't they? That's why you have St. Luke's in Kansas City. And when I came to Atchison, that's why you had St. Mary's in, in St. Joe and had Methodist Hospital in St. Joe. And that's why you have Providence in Kansas City. That's why you have Baptist uh, Memorial in Kansas City. That's why you used to have Trinity Lutheran in Kansas City, St. Joseph's in Kansas City, all these different hospitals. Who started all those? Congregations, huh? 
my congregation in western Kansas in Claflin, we were part of an org part of 13 congregations. We had 13 congregations. We all went together and started a ho hospital in Hoisington, Kansas, raised the money for that hospital, had memorials to buy the beds and all the materials and all the stuff like that in the hospital. There used to be, I don't know how many there are now, I think there used to be 12 or 13 Lutheran hospitals in Kansas. And uh, all of those are started. Now, think of this. Who started the first colleges? Where did the first colleges come from? From congregations, huh? Where did Harvard come from and Yale come from and Princeton come from? All the Eastern colleges, huh? Government colleges did not start until after the Civil War. That's when the government colleges started. That's when also uh, other colleges founded by um, uh, wealthy people started, you see. That all got started after the Civil War. And so you have Stanford and you have Cornell and you have uh, uh, the colleges that are started by wealthy people. You have Duke, you know, and uh, different ones. Cornell, of course, uh, he was the founder of Western Union. Uh, but that became a thing right after the Civil War when the wealth in America really began to grow. Railroads and all the different things that uh, those men who initially made those tons of money started colleges. Rockefeller, of course. Uh, Black College in Atlanta, Georgia, and then University of Chicago, all those. But before that came along, uh, it was the churches that started. And then where did education come from? Where did elementary education come from? From the churches, huh? Originally they started those, so in America, even in our country, you know, it was the churches who started the schools and so on. So that before there was ever the public school, there was the parochial school, the Catholic school, the Lutheran schools, so on. So uh, all of that came. Now, even today, uh, congregations, and, and sometimes, sometimes you'll hear this, well, why do you want to keep getting bigger and bigger? Why do you want to keep growing as a congregation? You know, why wouldn't you just keep a little small congregation? One of the things you want to keep growing, of course, is to reach more people for Jesus Christ and reach more people that will have the gift of heaven, but it also is so that you can do more in terms of reaching out to the world around you, because the larger the congregation becomes, the more you can do in the world out there, huh? Takes a larger congregation to support a school. You know, we have a school here. That takes, you can't do a, you can't support a school with just a hundred members. You have to have many members in order to do that. And some of the larger churches, my goodness, I, I'm always just amazed at some of the things that they're doing. You know, we have a church that is 25,000 members or something. My goodness, what you can do, and they do tremendous, tremendous things. You know. Uh, and you don't always hear about that, but you don't hear about the, like the prison ministry that goes on and uh, Jerry Falwell's, you know, the elementary system there and, and, uh, and the college and the university there and um, the home for unwed mothers that they have and just goes on and on and on. Uh, Thomas Road has its own alcoholism treatment center. And, and it's free, you know, and they have so many people in alcoholism treatment there all the time. And those larger congregations, you don't hear about that out here. You see them maybe on television or you see the preacher, you hear something about the preacher. But the tremendous ministries that are going on, because you don't have 25,000 members who are just coming to church on Sunday. They're very, very active in doing all kinds of things in the community. And so one of the reasons then is to, to reach more people for Christ so that you can reach more people outside for Christ too. So a Christian congregation is called to, to take, take care of its own, but number two, it is called for service. So we're called into a community of saints to, for our own safety, to look after each other spiritually. We're called into a community of saints to be reaching out into our community in terms of service. So we have a school here at our church. We have the Narcotics Anonymous house over there, and we support that. Not many people are maybe be even aware of that, but there are people over there, 15 to 20 people every night practically, except Thursday night, and uh, taking, uh, you know, there, and uh, that has reached and touched, you know, hundreds of people here in Northeast Kansas uh, through the years, and we support that. And of course, Trinity Place down there is also part of this, but all of the different ways in which we can reach out, so the school and these kind of things, come because we have and are able to do those and must continually look for more ways in which to reach people. But that's what a community of saints is, and that's um, what is brought out here when we say that in the creed, I believe in the community of saints. So the Holy Spirit 
doesn't leave us out there. He brings us into the community for our own spiritual safety and then to be of service. Now, when you're in the community of saints, you're going to be asked for money, right? Yes. And sometimes you hear that. Sometimes you'll hear this. The church is always asking for money. And what do you say when you hear that? We say, of course it is. That's why we are together as a community of saints. For a church not to be asking for money would be to a church is not doing what it is called to do because there's all kinds of need out here. Goodness gracious, there's all kinds of need out there and we're asking for money. So when we ask for money for world relief, we're asking, we've got to do something in terms of world hunger. And uh, here just recently, you know, we had a man from a Lutheran Heritage Organization here which prints all kinds of religious materials for people in, uh, in missions and over in Eastern Europe and so on. We had a man here from uh, Juice for Jesus, uh, from uh, Apple, of Your, Apple of Your Eye, and that's concerned with missions reaching, reaching Jewish people. And of course, there's all kinds of things. There's all kinds of things. You see all kinds of needs out there. And uh, right now, our congregation through our mission endowment, you know, we help support uh, a school in Mobile, Alabama, another parochial school in uh, inner city Detroit, inner city uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, because you have all these inner city schools which have a hard time supporting themselves. And we can support our own schools, so we must help them also support their schools too. And uh, even in our own community, this past uh, week, we sent a gift to uh, the Atchison Hospital up here, I mean the free clinic up here, you know, on North 2nd uh, that helps people in Atchison. huh? Yeah, Community Health Center, yes, also. We work through Catholic Charities. Catholic Charities here in town uh, helps with, uh, with housing and so on and so forth. And uh, so, uh, we can't handle all that ourselves. They have an organization, so we actually give to Catholic Charities for them to, to, to help them reach people that, uh, because we have people coming here and, and wanting help and with utilities and rent and that kind of thing. And um, we don't have the resources yet to handle all that. They do, and so we simply give to them to help them do it. And so they're helping, or we're helping them do their work, and we're doing that work in that way too. So uh, all of these different uh, things that we help with. But that's what we're called together as God's people to do. Now I've talked about the Holy Spirit and how he shapes us, works in us, and all these kind of things. And I want, to look, I want you to look at Galatians chapter 5, because this also describes what the Holy Spirit is going to do in you as you continue to hear God's word. And look at chapter 5, verse 22. Chapter 5, 22. By the way, sometimes if someone says, to, says that to you, you know, I don't want anything to do with Trinity Lutheran because they're always asking you for money, you say, goodness gracious, I am so glad to belong to a church that's always asking for money because that's a church that's doing something in the world and they're concerned about the needs of others. And that's the kind of church I want to belong to. Anyway, 522. 522. And by the way, sometimes I've heard that there are preachers who do not like to ask for money. <laughs> That's not here. <laughs> I've never been embarrassed. Because I'm not asking for me, I'm asking for the Lord, and I'm asking for the work that the Lord has sent us to do. Yeah. But anyway, look at chapter 5, verse 22. This is the fruit of the Spirit. You see this is on page 975, 975. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Now, this is sanctification. And the Holy Spirit is now going to work in you. He's going to work in any person, every person here in the community of saints. He's going to work to reshape you, just like we heard about. This is this whole thing of sanctification. What's he going to shape you into? You keep coming to hear his word and, and you surrender to him. He's going to shape you into a person more and more like Jesus Christ. And that's what all of that is. He said, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Every one of those words describe Jesus. And so the Holy Spirit's work is to help us to grow into people more and more 
like Jesus. People of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Yes. Our Lord Jesus, of course, was a, that's a description of, of him. Uh, he was a tough man, and you saw him drive the uh, uh, sellers of stuff out of the temple. My goodness, uh, he walked into the desert and came out of the desert. You know, he was, he was a tough man physically. He was a tough man emotionally and spiritually. But he was also this man of great, great heart, this man of great love, this man of kindness who reached out to all kinds of people. And see, that's the thing that you see again. And that's what the community of saints is about. Because Jesus reaches out to Nicodemus, who's rich and powerful. And Joseph of Arimathea, same thing, kind of thing. But then he's also reaching out to the woman at the well, who's been married five times and living with a guy that she's not married to. And so you see this wide range of people. Here's, um, here's Zacchaeus, this guy who's been cheating people all during his life, taking advantage of people, and he comes to know Jesus, and he's a whole new man. He's giving back what he's taken and that kind of thing. So you see Jesus working with all these kind of people. Huh? And even in his birth, you see the significance of his birth, the significance of the wise men coming and the shepherds coming. That's the two levels of society. The wise men are at the very top of society. They are wealthy. They are rich. They are educated. They are the very top of society. And here's the shepherds coming, the very bottom of society, who have no education. No one trusts them. They are the gypsies of their day. Everyone thinks they're going to steal everything that you've got if they come around. And so why do these two groups show up at the birth of Jesus, come to worship him? What it all tells us is that that's what he's going to be doing. He's going to be bringing all of these people into a Christian congregation. Hmm. By the way, you see this as you read the epistles. And uh, my goodness, Paul talks about all the different kinds of people in, uh, in the congregation. And one, they, one of the things they did too was they welcomed slaves. My goodness, that was unheard of, that you would welcome slaves into a, into a community of saints. And yet they did there in those biblical days, in those New Testament days. Didn't make any difference, your background. Uh, Jesus was reaching out to each and every person. Those 12 disciples that he had, my goodness, what a conglomeration they were and what a bunch of characters they were. Fishermen, tax collector. Zealot, a zealot is a, is a political redneck, you know, type of person. All of these he brings together into these, uh, into these, uh, into his church. Lousy. We would look at that today. He's looking for church workers, the men who are going to carry on his, on his great mission. And we'd look at this and we'd say, man, he's a lousy recruiter. Good gracious. What's he thinking? Bringing all these characters together. And he's going to send them out into the world because they're all going to reach different people. See, that's the thing. They're all going to reach different people. And that's the community of saints. Well, it's a beautiful, beautiful picture. <clears throat> and a congregation can be a beautiful, beautiful place. But always we must remember, though, too, that every one of us in this community, saints, is a what? Sinner. A sinner. What do sinners do? Sin. A sin. Against whom? each other yeah so yes so even in the community of saints where we all belong to Jesus Christ are we going to hurt each other's feelings are, are we going to say dumb things to each other yeah are we going to get mad at each other sometimes yes 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 the thing of it is we have to work those things out through our Lord Jesus Christ we are going to sin against each other <sighs> and um that's a sad part of it. But we have to work that out. And we have to be forgiving toward each other. A community of saints is built on forgiveness. Just like our relationship to Jesus Christ is built on forgiveness. And we can stay together only as we are forgiving each other and loving each other and working with each other and doing everything we can to understand each other. Where we come from, our background, and all of those kind of things. Yes. And the Holy Spirit... <coughs> teaches us how to love one another. Love one another. Jesus said, as he left the disciples, 
after that night in the upper room, he says, tells him to love one another as I have loved you. And my goodness, they had experienced his love in so many ways. And now they were to go out into the world, but they are to love one another as the Lord Christ has loved them. And so you and I, too, are called to, in the congregation, to love one another as our Lord has loved us. So safety and service, okay? Any questions? I don't have a, I don't have a sheet with me. You've got all the questions answered, Justin? No. Nope. You don't? Okay. Let me see if I can... If we can get those yet. It is the Holy Spirit who hmm? creates and you know, strengthens faith. Yes, that would work, wouldn't it? Who gives and uh, creates faith. First Corinthians 3 says that no one can call Jesus Lord except by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit enlightens us. This means that through God's word we continually grow in our knowledge and, boy, what was I thinking when I wrote that? I don't know. I'm going to have to think about this. Maybe I'll give you the answers next week. The Holy Spirit sanctifies us. It means that through God's word, he helps us overcome sin and shapes us into saints. What? Into what? Beautiful. New people. That's good. That's good. Very good. Yeah, after the Holy Spirit gives faith, he puts into, puts the person into a community of saints. Got that one. In the New Testament, a saint is simply a believer. The Holy Spirit calls us into a congregation for our safety and service. As fellow believers, we are to love one another, edify one another, comfort one another, encourage one another. As the Holy Spirit works on us through the Word and Sacrament, Galatians 5.22 says, He shapes us more and more into people like Jesus of what? Love, joy, peace, patience, and so on. Those are all that You can get those out of 5.22. The Holy Spirit does all His work through means. Those means are God's Word and sacrament, sacraments. He works through the Gospel. But the gospel also comes to us in baptism and the Lord's Supper. And next week we will start studying baptism because the baptism, baptism is the Holy Spirit's means and agency of, again, creating faith. And so that's why we wait until this lesson. Sometimes people want to talk about baptism first thing off. But we don't do that because you, to understand baptism, you've got to understand the work of the Holy Spirit. And uh, so that's why we're going to do that next week, okay?